Skyer's Breath by Susan York. Climbing the steep and narrow spiral staircase while trying to keep a mug of nettle tea steady isn't the easiest task, but it's one I'm well accustomed to. Cliff turns away from the crenulations of the observation tower as I reach the top. Thanks, B, he says, taking the mug in both hands as if they were cold, despite the humidity. Across the water towards the world, Gaia's breath is whipping grey clouds, scudding them across the sky. I lick my finger and hold it up. Today, she is blowing from the north. Sipping his tea, Cliff grunts in appreciation. The latest farmer brought honey. Did he say which farm? He asks. I shrug. One of the orchards, those with him, brought fruit. Cliff keeps his eyes on the land between here and the hills. The castle our tribe lives in has been surrounded by water since before I was born. Nothing remains of the once thriving city below the steep roads that rise out of the lake or the farmland and towns my mother told me used to exist before the Great Flood. Many years passed before the land between here and the salt marshes bordering the sea was reclaimed to grow crops, nurture bees and support wildlife. Now, those who work on the farms are coming here. There's no room for any more people. We need all the garden area the car castle's got to feed those of us already here. Despite what they bring, I ask? Yes, there's only so much you can carry on foot, and not many have cars. He points across the water to a lone vehicle on the far shore. They're useless once they run out of power. The nearest charging bays are on the farms, and if what we're hearing is true, it's not safe to go there. He pauses, then says, we can't raid those farms any more, so need to be self-sufficient. I can only agree. Sleeping and feeding extra bodies is difficult in the confined space of our walls. The prison cells we live in number under a hundred, and they're stacked over two floors. The ground floor of the building is used for storage and holds various workshops, plus there is a kitchen and an area we gather in to eat. I place my arm around his waist. Cliff leans his hard body against mine and we stand together for a moment. Who's taking care of Holly? Cliff asks. Fern. Taking his eyes off the far shore, Cliff looks at me. His bushy eyebrows rise high in his craggy forehead. Fern? Well, I never. He once again looks towards the wolds. She sees a future for Holly. Others don't. A brief nod is all the acknowledgement I get as Cliff shades his eyes with his right hand. After focusing intently on the distance, he says, Tell Heather to send two boats. Our hunters return, and they've got four others with them. I head down the steep stairs until I reach the castle walkway. Heather is in the grounds, praying to Gaia. The altar of our goddess stands near the gardens we till and plant from seeds stolen, in the past, from the now stricken farms. It is fitting that where we worship our deity is close to the soil amidst all this stone, for Gaia is a living entity. Disrupting someone at prayer is never a thankful task, but Heather merely sighs. What meat were the hunters carrying? she asks. Cliff didn't say. The direct stare I get tells me I should know. Heather folds her arms below her breast, saying, Let's hope they've got more than a few rabbits and hares. There's plenty of wildlife now but it won't be long before it's as scarce as before. Scarcer, maybe. She abruptly walks away, heading towards the castle gate to pass the message on and arrange a greeting party. Heather's back is straight, and her long plait swings with the sway of her hips. Despite this suggestion of femininity, she is physically commanding, tall and muscular. Heather is right. Although the land to the east is full of game, like the farmers, it is fleeing and dying. Around the fire, our hunters tell of dead animals, blistered bodies and makeshift graves as they draw near the road leading to the coast. Cliff is on the observatory tower not just to watch for strangers and returning hunters. He's there to alert us when the threat draws near. Problem is, we have no idea what the threat is. Fern smiles as I enter the square cell which is my home. It is one of a few corner rooms which are big enough in the prison complex to house a family. Once the rooms and corridors were painted cream. 
they would have reflected the sun when it streamed in through the tall arched windows at each end of the building, through the smaller windows in each cell. The black wrought iron staircases between the floors would have gleamed. Once the prison would have been full of light. Now most of the paint has flaked off, revealing dull grey stone beneath. Curved iron staircases are tinged with orange rust. When the sun does shine through what remains of the windows, the building hums with an oppressive dullness. Placing a finger against her lips, Fern rises from Holly's bed and joins me by the door. Holly's just fallen asleep. She loves learning the old tales, but it tires her. Fern glances at my daughter and smiles affectionately. Her face crinkles into deep lines. Fern longed for a child of her own, but that time is gone and she has chosen Holly as her successor. Cliff and I are grateful you're teaching her. Fern grips my arms with firm hands and pulls me into the narrow corridor. She must live. Without a storyteller, the old tales will die. Bring Holly to the fireside tonight. Let her hear me tell the tale I'm teaching her so I can see how much of it she knows. Although the words are quietly spoken, Fern's passion for her trade is undeniable, the feather in her eyes plain. When her grip relaxes, I hug her. I pray to Gaia every day that she'll get well. I know you do the same. Gaia's blessings on you, Fern. The older woman pulls away, patting my shoulder. We understand each other, Fern and I. I cross to Holly's bed. My daughter is one of the few children born in the past decade. She has pushed the coarse woolen cover down to her waist. Her fingers are bone thin, her body skeletal, and much of her skin is so pale it appears translucent. Her lungs rattle and wheeze as she breathes, they're terribly congested, but Holly's spirit is strong. Gently moving her brown hair aside, I check her forehead with the back of my hand. She is cooler than this morning. Perhaps her fever has broken. Pressing my lips against the flush of her cheek, I offer a silent prayer to Gaia. Cliff and I have hidden our fear and worry. Nonetheless, it is there. It eats away at us. Thank you.